to you the colloquy anthem. Please sit back and enjoy. उसी अगस्त की बेला में हम सौ गंड उठाते हैं सशक्त राष्ट्र के सपने को चलो मिलकर आज सजाते हैं हर युवा को रोजगार मिले हर नारी की आजादी हो हर घर स्वास्थ्य सबल बने ये गली गली बुनादी हो Over to you, Gandhi. Thank you, Gauri. Am I audible? Sorry, yes. Uh, when I sorry. Yeah, I'm audible, right? I can't see. Yes, you're audible. Yeah. All right. So, good evening, everyone. My name is Vinay Kumar, and I extend a very warm welcome to you all to the second edition of India Rural Colloquy. TRIF's annual flagship event. Today is the eighth session in this edition, and we have seen some absolutely fascinating discussions in the past few days by a number of global and national thought leaders in conversation on almost everything and every aspect that affects rural India. Today we will be discussing another very important aspect: How is rural India? That is almost 70% of India represented in the media. We have seen very little or no coverage about issues, lives, opportunities, and challenges faced by nearly two thirds of our population, while certain select issues continue to dominate our media 24 by 7 non stop. Even sporadic and occasional coverage is limited to reports on farm suicides and functioning of some half panchayats. The result is obvious that most people, and especially those in urban areas, believe in stereotypes created over the years that essentially suggest that rural means backward, stagnant, stranded, and a drag on growth. The reality is quite to the contrary. Rural India is dynamic, developing at a much faster pace with transformational changes in areas such as women empowerment, rural livelihoods, sanitation, tribal welfare, health and nutrition, particularly in the past two decades. And, but these are rarely talked about in our media. So the obvious question is, does the media give enough voice to issues on margins and the marginalized? And what can the media do right? At TRIF, we believe that unless the whole of India is sensitive, involved, and contributes to India's inclusive growth agenda, we will end up in a very lopsided development and will be left far behind in our commitment to equity, justice, and a dignified life for every citizen. That is the reason why we focus on sensitizing the urban educated Indians about the issues and challenges of Bharat so that they become participants in the development process. Through Village Square, an initiative that I am so privileged to be associated with, we make an effort to bridge this information gap. Village Square is a digital communications platform that passionately pursues the vivid and the complex stories of India's rural life. Our stories go beyond the stereotypes of rural India's trials and tribulations of poverty and inequality. While championing the schemes and change makers, driving progress in all facets of life, from health and livelihoods to education and environment, we also bring forward 
the vibrancy of village life, the art, the culture, festivals, the fads, social trends, and what have you. Through our multimedia content, we want young urban India to sit up and listen, to take notice of the villages that are the backbone of this country. We want to tell the stories and insights that unite the people of this country, regardless of where they live. Besides feature articles on Village Square, we conduct interviews, Insta lives, and photo essays to provide a complete engaging package for our audience. Through Youth Hub, another vertical within Village Square, our primary objective is to sensitize urban educated youth on the complexities of rural development and connect them to rural India. We reach out to them in a variety of ways through university and college campuses, youth associations, and also working with CSOs to sensitize them on issues, challenges, and promises of rural India. Several events focusing on rural life through dramas, songs, paintings, foods, debates, round tables, and short movies are organized across campuses and youth associations. Our third vertical within Village Square is the Development Intelligence Unit that is focused on data and evidence and stimulates a variety of stakeholders working towards India's rural transformation development. They gather, collate, analyze, and make sense of tons of data. And finally, give us very simple but meaningful dashboard about the toughest and most difficult issues facing our rural life. Friends, I'm super excited to anchor today's conversation and how we can give voice and mainstream issues of margins and the marginalized, influence public opinion and possibly public policy going forward. And to discuss this, we have for you an eminent panel that distinguishes itself in the kind of journalism each one of them have chosen to pursue, that is, to give voice to the unheard and take up issues that need immediate attention. I am absolutely delighted to introduce Mr. Nilesh Mishra, who actually doesn't really need much of an instruction. He occupies a unique space among communications professionals. He's the founder of Gaon Connection, India's biggest rural media platform that reaches nearly 23 million people every month across digital and print platforms. He is the India's most loved storyteller who revived the storytelling and is one of the main contributors to the revival of radio listening in India over the past decade. Mr. Mishra also commands huge popularity in the digital universe. He conservatively reaches more than 100 million listeners every month across platforms, including Big FM, Spotify, Audible, All India Radio, and so on. He has won several awards, including the prestigious Ramnath Goenka Awards twice. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you, Mr. Mishra, on this uh, panel. And I must also say that we had the pleasure of having him at the World Localization Day recently. And we were aghast to see the kind of fan following he had amongst the youth. So welcome, welcome Nilesh. Our second panelist is Mr. Rajesh Mahapatra, a distinguished journalist and currently an editor at the Press Trust of India. He has worked for, in several roles for the last two decades or so. And, and he recently joined PTI, but before that, he was the chief content officer at the Hindustan Times and played an instrumental role in the evolution of Hindustan Times to a digital first news organization. He has worked at the Associated Press as its business writer for South Asia for several decades and is the founder forum for Orissa Dialogues. Welcome, Radish, and uh, great to have you on this panel. I remember when I was a journalist for a few years, way back in late 70s, PTI used to be our main competitor. So we always looked up to PTI to 
help us compete better. And a third panelist is uh, Ambika Singh Tama, who is a content head and chief correspondent, a special project at the NDTV and focuses on health, environment, gender equality, and so on. A journalist for over 20 years, she has led several cause, social cause campaigns, such as Banega Swatch India and Banega Swast India. Other noteworthy special projects that she has been associated with are Save Our Tigers, Dil Seva, Dil Se Seva, Defeating Diabetes, Road to Safety, Every Life Counts, and many more. I mean, there's a long list of things that she has been pursuing. And when we were talking this morning, the passion with which she pursues her uh, vocation is absolutely astounding. And she also co-anchors the now almost legendary 20-hour live Banega Swast India telethon with campaign ambassador Mr. Amita Bachchan and Dr. Panoy Roy. So Amrita, thank you very much for joining us and, uh, and we look forward to having a great conversation. Our fourth panelist, unfortunately, Anubha uh, Bosley could not join as she suddenly fell ill and is down with COVID. So she has expressed her apologies and, uh, and we are actually we regret not having her. So she brings another unique experience to the table. And finally, I'm so delighted to introduce my very distinguished colleague and friend, Lindy Prickett, who is the chief editor at Village Square. She is a journalist, digital journalist, writer, and podcaster. She began her career with BBC Radio and then worked as a producer for Reuters for over a decade in London, Singapore, Mumbai, and New Delhi, which probably brought her to India. Independently, she wrote and produced the groundbreaking digital short story, WeAreAngry.net, about India's rape crisis, which the Guardian called devastatingly powerful. She also produces a world news podcast for children, Newsy Pulusi, with her nine-year-old daughter, which was listed by New York Times as one of the 30 best podcasts for children. So she brings a lot of energy, stamina, and, and, and innovation to Village Square, and it's fascinating to work with her. Now, I, she has also very kindly agreed to moderate this session. And uh, so I'll now turn it over to Lindy to moderate the session. Let me meanwhile just request all of you to please keep sending your questions in the Q&A Q &A box, and we will take them towards the end of the session. Over to you, Lindy. Thank you so much, Vinay. Thanks uh, for everyone joining, um, especially being a Sunday and in the middle of the monsoon when really probably all we want to do is be wrapped up reading a book, drinking chai, or perhaps at this time of night, something stronger. But we're here to talk about a really important subject and a subject that really is at the heart of Village Square. As Vinay so well uh, said, we are here to try and champion the stories that don't get told. We, our tagline says it all, we, we talk about the stories and insights from rural India. I just before I, I, I hand over, I just want to say that one of the reasons that this was such an exciting opportunity for me is as a journalist for too many years to mention, how many times would I go to an editor with a story that I think is really interesting, that I think is really meaningful, and I would be told, not just in foreign newsrooms, but in Indian newsrooms as well, that it's really, really a good story, but it's a bit dull, but worthy. I've also been told that those kind of stories are NGO journalism. And then occasionally I've even been told by some fellow Indian colleagues, haha, that story would be great for your foreign friends, but we're not interested here. And it was a message that actually, India was on the rise. I came in 2006, it was the India growth story, it was bricks, everything was happening. It was all upwardly mobile living. People were getting washing machines, wearing blue jeans, having their new smartphones. They weren't interested in what was happening in rural India. 
So that's why Village Square is so exciting because we're able to tell the stories that a lot of other people don't want to tell. But what I want to know from you guys, because y'all are some of the, the you know, most esteemed journalists in the country and storytellers, which are perhaps one in the same, but we can talk about that in a minute, um, or maybe it should be one in the same. What I want to know is what is y'all's experience from various point of views, being an editor, being from you know, radio and Bollywood background to turn sort of media mogul, storyteller extraordinaire, and a very respected journalist with a very respected TV channel. What has been your experience over the years about covering what might be considered dull but worthy stories? Uh, let's start with you, Rajesh, because I know that it's somebody who's been a journalist at the Hindustan Times for so long. You must have had so many people coming and giving you story ideas and pitches, and now you're at the helm of PTI. So what is your experience about stories that are on covering people that are in the margins and the marginalized. Are you gang-ho gung -ho ready for them or are you a little sort of trying to always keep that aspirational Indian in mind? Thank you, Lindy. Uh, thank you, uh, PRF, uh, PRIF, uh, for giving me this opportunity to join you. In fact, to be honest, uh, I mean, I had heard about Village Square once in a while, seen the link here and there, but after we spoke last time, I uh, actually went and checked out your site in detail. I think you are doing a wonderful job. Uh, we need more of village squares. Uh, and I think there are several uh, you know, groups uh, who are, are trying to you know, fill that gap that you are talking about. Uh, so congratulations for doing such a fantastic and commendable uh, job. Uh, and I uh, am very proud to be uh, associated today. Uh, in, in, in directly, I can say that I'm also getting drawn into that effort of yours. So uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, now, I, I have a little different take uh, from what you said. Uh, you know, in newsrooms, it's always uh, everyone is competing to find a slot, to find a space. In the good old days when journalism was driven largely by newspapers and television, uh, there were limited airtime and there were limited uh, print space, right? So uh, you you know there were reasons to be disappointed. Even when editors wanted to accommodate uh, things, uh, they found it difficult. Uh, but you know. Uh, we will come to this, uh, you know, giving voice to issues on the margins. How do I uh, understand that proposition? But in short, what I would say, it's a continuous battle. It's a, you know, it, 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 it varies from newspapers to newspaper, the editorial policies, the times that you are functioning in. And you are very right. When everything is going fine, everybody was gung ho about India's, uh, you know, the aspirational future that India was looking into, uh, people wanted to hear and read very different kind of stories. And every time you get hit by a crisis, uh, then people start wondering, you know, why are we in a state that we are in? Uh, and then they start looking for different kind of stories. I have always believed that, uh, despite you know, uh, in a in a in a young democracy such as India. In a developing economy such as India, uh, in a liberal democracy that we talk about, the media has a role to play, very important role to play. And I have always uh, uh, taken it that the media, in, in, in the context that we are operating in, in the democracy that we are, uh, in the state of development that we are uh, in this country, media has to have a bias in favor of the marginalized. It ought to have a bias in favor of the marginalized. That has been my position. However, uh, and no one, no one in charge of any media organization would dispute that. On the face of it, they would all admit it. However, that does not reflect in how a newspaper or a television channel, or even for that matter, a digital channel, actually goes about aggregating or producing its content, right? So there is a gap between that politically correct stance and what actually happens in the reality. But at the end of the day, I think there is enough room uh, where a good story 
can make its way through. And I think I, I, I'm going to stop here. I think, you know, so long as you have a compelling story, uh, it does stand a chance. It is not outrightly dismissed. Uh, I think a lot of people in Indian newsrooms are sensitized enough uh, about the bias that I uh, talked about. Uh, and more so today when uh, things are predominantly going digital, where you do not have that real estate constraint as far as print medium is concerned or the airtime constraint as far as the television medium is concerned, uh, I think there's great opportunity and we can see how all of you are kind of leveraging it. But I would stop here and I would leave it to Nilesh because you know he can bring some real examples as to when you have a compelling stories because there are some projects we did even at Hindustan Times where you know people were really competing for space. There were, I mean, he may talk about something called India Yatra where actually we did something very unconventional uh, ahead of election. You know, when people go and talk to the politician, they're after the politician, much before the election, he took the lead to start something called India Yatra and what it was and how it was to actually bring about the other side of the voice, which is never heard during elections. I would leave it to him to talk about it rather than I preempt it. But I think there is enough potential, uh, enough space for us to navigate so long as we remain committed to that objective of maintaining a bias in favor of the marginalized. And we know how to smartly navigate our way through. Okay, well then, Nilesh, over to you. <laughs> oh, you'll just have to unmute. So I have a I have a lot of thoughts on this. So what would you like me to speak on? What's your question? <laughs> okay. So what is your experience when it comes? I mean, you, you you're the you're the sort of epitome of of in in some ways embracing trying to tell stories of the marginalized and people on the margins. What would you say? I hope we haven't just lost you there, Nilesh. What would you say has been your experience in trying to get these stories out to a greater number of people? Okay, thank you. So um, I have, uh, because my family background um, has been such that my my parents have been have set up a school in, uh, in uh, rural UP, which is completing 50 years this week. So I have grown up in that milieu, uh, rural India. Uh, the the challenges of uh, what happens there has been very very familiar to me. When I became a journalist, um, again, uh, a lot of the stories I did uh, had a rural skew or a rural uh, prism. And I always uh, used to wonder why um, rural India is not there in, uh, with a greater force in the mainstream media. That said, um, uh, until then, I was in the Associated Press where uh, there wasn't any like rural urban you know, bias as such. I mean, it was like whatever uh, uh, work. But when I joined the Hindustan Times um, and I started my journey in the newspaper uh, there, I mean, Hindustan Times uh, before Rajesh. Uh, so um, uh, I, I found myself a loner uh, in some ways uh, because I found that uh, long form or uh, reportage or, or, or you know, grassroots uh, journalism um, didn't have many takers uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, it had takers in the editorial, but uh, the assumption was that there are not enough takers among the readers. Um, so let's not do that. Uh, I was, thankfully, because I was hired at a senior enough position, I was never asked to not do anything or, um, you know, um, I had that uh, privilege, so to say. But I feel that uh, at that time I started elbowing around uh, for space for rural India on the um, uh, front page and other pages of Hindustan Times. And then uh, I was made the national special projects editor and then Rajesh uh, joined and we were both uh, deputy executive editors. And we, I, I think we shared a common um, uh, bias, as he says, uh, for the marginalized. And I, 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 I'm... I was able to pull off some small rebellions, uh, some small coups, so to say. Uh, there was um, uh, there was India Yatra, which was an uh, when when um, 
or the national elections was happening, I thought let's let's cover politics without speaking to a single politician. The coverage of politics uh, politics in India is always about uh, you know he said she said and 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 that's it. The mic is towards the stage and you have no idea what what the people want to say or. or that it's it's closely hyphenated to speeches. That's what it is. Coverage is, means speeches, um, and maybe it is so in the in in, in the West, in America, and, and other places as well. But I I was keen that we reinvent that a bit. So uh, we did a, this project where we sent out uh, thirty reporters, and I was the thirtieth um, uh, on you know on journeys across the country, and every journey had a certain theme. Uh, so every so they did uh, did these um, micro series of uh, four or five stories uh, and very focused and then we later converted it into a book etc cetera, etc cetera. and and then that uh, the you know the uh, the response to that of course my colleagues on the political bureau side hated me because for 40 full days i had hogged uh, one full page uh, at a time which was theirs. I mean, this was the time they waited for. This was election time. And at that point, the national, the, the special projects team says, well, you know, this, by the way, this page is ours for the next 40 days. Uh, see you after the election. So it uh, elbowing around space for this kind of writing uh, took uh, some doing. Uh, but I'm uh, really happy that uh, as a paper itself, um, Hindustan Times, gave space to that. And then we did another series called uh, India Besieged, which um, uh, took us to nine states, uh, uh, which was, uh, you know, we start, it started with an uh, RTI application where I had asked how much money that is sent to insurgency affected districts in the country is used and how much is not used. And uh, some good person in the home ministry sent me 252 pages of uh, data at that point, uh, which basically said uh, that 52% of budgets being sent to the uh, rural areas uh, affected by insurgency is just not used, uh, uh, comes back. It was a staggering number. But uh, rather than doing like one database story, we decided to go out there. And uh, again, Hindustan Times um, uh, did a very long series. Again, that then we had a new editor, there was some squabbling over it. Uh, he came from your side of the woods, may I add, without adding any name. Um, uh, and and um, it took some doing. But when the series came out, uh, we won the Ramnath Goenka Award for it. And like um, India Yatra, we made this into a book, etc. Et so I'm, I think we were able to etch out space. And then uh, I left uh, Hindustan Times and I and I could see from a distance that uh, uh, Rajesh would now then become a you know much bigger boss was um, uh, was um, you know letting all this happen and enabling this you know so my point is uh, that it's not that mainstream media does not want to cover uh, rural India uh, yes of course there'll be pushes from the marketing all that. But I think we just need uh, better storytelling of it. We need better writing. Uh, if a New York Times can do a page one, uh, you know, long form piece about, you know, a, a village somewhere in UP or somewhere in West Bengal, uh, I, I have often asked my uh, colleagues at Gaon Connection to go back and write uh, and read what other colleagues, maybe Western colleagues have, uh, how they have written the same story, just for structure, how they, you know, the nut graft, just the basics. Right. Of it. And, and um, that, that's something that I want to talk about in a minute. It, I, I'm curious to kind of boil down into that and find out if it's our, our treatment of that. But be, before I go into that, because I think that's a really important um, um, part of this conversation, let me just go over to. Oh, go ahead. This will make it a little uh, you know, uh, confusing for what I'm going to say next. So just a kicker. Um, I, I, you know, that said, uh, Rural India, of course, has uh, virtually zero priority for mainstream media as a whole. I mean, so so this is this is the dichotomy. If you write a great story, I feel it will make it because just because it's a great story. Because the editors themselves often don't 
you have to first sell the story to the to the desk and and then to to the to the readers uh, but uh, when i started dark connection um uh, there was a study by csds that year which said that only 2% of mainstream media space is devoted to rural india and out of that 2% 36% is de devoted to stereotypical issues right uh, i have always wondered uh, you know why why there was no voice for rural india i tried to raise not raise funds because i'm naive on that i'm still i'm very very naive on raising funds etc but um, um I, i at one point of uh, frustration and anger and some desperation i uh, i sold my house in noida uh, in sector 93a more famously the same complex is has uh, is soon going to have two of its towers blown up uh, so I'm, i'm i mean that's that's the identity but um but i because that because i realized that what i wanted to do was not going to get done in mainstream india anytime soon so that's the that's the dichotomy sorry for the long rambling yeah piece no 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 that's interesting the the history and 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 how you came to to create this this um this powerful voice i think that really is is doing a sensational job of of not just um representing a group of people but as you as you say using stories to do that but ambika i want to go to you because i think of all the the networks at least the english networks indi tv is known for embracing uh stories that aren't just politicians aren't just men in suits or cryptos um but are actually about real people and covering um video elements of of real people as well so tell me if there is what you have found in your career along the way has there been a sort of um occasionally have you had to push forward your stories and fight a little harder for them because you're not talking about aspirational india or the latest startup or the latest political scandal thanks so much i think it's a pleasure to be here and i don't have the expertise like rajesh ji or nitesh ji here because they've been doing it for years now i started as a sports journalist and then when we talk about gender i did have a you know i had a break in my career and then when i came back 10 years later i had to voice and i you know i really wanted to do something when it comes to do with social issues and luckily for me nditv has a vertical you know called the special projects where they only do social issues so we have different campaigns and uh, you know i've been a part of it and i started my you know i mean i would say my comeback was with the campaign called the banega swachh india the prime minister had launched you know when we really talk about you know the banega the swachh swachh india and then that gradually has turned into swachh india but it is the longest running television channel but luckily for me um, ndtv is that we create uh, it's never been an issue because when the story is there the content is there i think that's what we look at you know rather than again looking at the great numbers or what sells we always look at the content and when we started um, we are in fact we are you know it's end of season 8 now 15th august is the culmination and we were lucky to get a campaign ambassador like mr amita bachan who is really passionate about the cause you know i mean he really believes what he says so we were lucky luckily you know we had him spearheading the campaign but along with that i think the kind of stories when this campaign started going into rural india we started a bus you know the swachh bus which actually went and you know to understand the real life of what people in rural india be and when we talk about mainstream india i mean nearly 70% of india i mean is living in the rural part of the country so it's very important to put out stuff there and i think the campaign we've got a lot of support from whether it's the celebrities whether the people but i think for us it was important to put out the actual stuff out there um just to give an example like of course i've been traveling and that's what i enjoy the most of my about my job is that you know i went to the interiors like whether it's garcharoli worked with you know pioneers like uh, dr abhay bang how they you know really changed the the whole health healthcare sitlingi valley in tamil nadu which is really in the interiors how dr reggie is working so you know going seeing learning so much and really understanding that how we really need to put out stories of rural india i mean for that matter um, on the 15th of august the culmination of season 8 talks about the asha workers um a lot of people living in urban india don't know what asha workers are but how important is their link really when we talk about healthcare uh now suddenly everybody is talking about it because who has given them you know has honored them and felicitated them so you know we are, we're talking a lot more about them but how critical a role do they play so i think it's important that we look at all these facets we put it out there and it's it's a very important i mean I, it media plays a very very important role in putting out things out there 
Okay, thank you so much. This is really interesting to get everybody's perspective. It's it's obvious that we're all sort of singing from the the same hymn sheet, so to speak. And um and we, we kind of um what I want though is is since there are so many NGOs and civil society organizations that are part of this call and that are listening that will be watching the videos as well. What can y'all say to them as editors, as people that are that are that are receiving information and story ideas and pitches? When an organization says, wow, you should, you should see what this Asha worker, Asha Didi says, she, she had the most amazing experience. I want to get her story out there. But perhaps it's written in maybe an academic way, or it's full of acronyms or um, uh, uh, those, those um, jargon. What advice can each of you give to civil society organizations, to even ordinary campaigners who are passionate about the topic and want to get their story out? What can you say to them, um, Rajesh, I'm gonna to go to you first because you're the one that's at the helm of PTI. When you've got people coming in and you're stifling through, stifling, um, um, uh, sifting through these stories, what could you say to an organization to try and get them to write something or pitch something that's actually gonna get you interested and say, hey, this is a story we need to cover? I'm going to make a disclaimer that whatever I say here, uh, they are my personal views. Uh, and, uh, you know, I had taken a break from full-time journalism. In 2018, I quit my job. I went back to my native state, Odisha. Uh, and the idea was uh, I wanted to use uh, the time to travel across India. Uh, but unfortunately, the pandemic happened. So I got mostly confined to my state. But I did travel a lot, and I don't know whether you know this bit of statistics, but before that, the disclaimers, my views are personal, and uh, in no way they can be construed as uh, anything that uh, I'm suggesting in my capacity uh, of being the editor of PTI. Uh, now, a uh, uh, little bit of data point, Odisha actually, uh, among all Indian states, has got the highest incidence of NGOs in terms of their con concentration. <laughs> and I have kind of traveled across and I hear them. Uh, what my advice to NGOs would be, which is what I have given to many in the last three years, uh, and which is what uh, I have seen over the last two decades. Uh, there are some who do uh, a good job uh, with their story pictures, uh, but most NGOs, in India do not do a good job with their story pictures. They don't do enough of homework, number one. Number two, they need to moderate their expectations when they approach a journalist. Uh, I think, you know, uh, when they put in uh, their efforts, uh, they, they have very unrealistic expectations. And when those expectations don't materialize, they give up. They, they, they give up on the relationship as well, you see? Uh, overnight, you cannot come with a story to a reporter and say, you know, uh, here is a great story to be told. Uh, third uh, is that, uh, you know, it's, uh, whether it is rural India Ooh, or urban this third India, point is. Uh, am I audible? I can't hear Lindy. Uh, okay. You are audible. Please go. Okay. Okay. The, thirdly, uh, you see, whether it is urban India or rural India, we are people living on margins, uh, not just in rural India, in urban India. In fact, the challenge of uh, people living on the margins in urban India has sharply uh, gotten exacerbated in the last decade or so. So uh, uh, I just lost the thought what I was going to say, uh, I, I just lost it. Uh, let me come back. Uh, I mean, this is what happens with Zoom that, you know, your yes, thought I'm process. So, I'm so sorry. I thought I thought that um, we lost you, but I think it was me that dropped out. So I'm sorry. You must have heard me coming in late and interrupting you. I'm going to talk for a moment, hoping that point comes back to you. Has it come back? Well, no, we can... I mean, when the thought breaks, it breaks. I mean, it's just <laughs> goes away. Okay. 
Uh, okay. Well, well, let let me let me now um, because I think this was really really good to get some practical um, uh, advice like that is so helpful. Uh, to you know, at, at Village Square, we're both working with the engineer. Yeah, I got it. I got it. You took the name of Village Square, and I got it. Yeah. All right. So most of the time, when we are reporting uh, about people on margins or the marginalized, it doesn't have to be a story of despair. There are many stories of hope, right? And it's also that story of hope that needs to be covered. Uh, and that's what, uh, you know, Village Square does so wonderfully. And people want to read those stories, even in urban areas, right? Uh, now, how do you tell the story? Uh, those stories of hope, again, have to be credible stories of hope. So how do you make them credible? Uh, they, 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 there's a lot of work that has to go into it. Uh, you know, my colleague Ambika was talking about the thing, kind of things they are doing. And uh, many of those stories are actually stories of hope. There's a website called The Better India, which actually made a good start. But now, you know, they have, in my, my view, they have kind of lost the track. Uh, but, uh, but they did come up with these stories. Uh, so I just want to go back to the story where uh, Nilesh was talking, how we kind of started gaining more space and how these stories of hope uh, can actually get you an alive from a very unexpected quarter. So Nilesh, I think, left about 2011 or so. And around that time, the slowdown was hitting us. And, uh, you know, our business side, uh, as Nilesh was talking, you know, the marketing sometimes comes to you and tells you, oh, readers want this because our readers are mostly urban based, right? So. I want to talk about this small example because we are all storytellers, right? We tell these stories and through these stories, we convey certain messages. So uh, these were slow down times and uh, the newspaper was struggling to find uh, new advertisement revenues or new revenue streams. Corporates were uh, grappling with what to do. Now, I saw Tata Tea. Uh, it's a big company. It had a campaign called Jago Ray. Uh, and the campaign was basically about uh, drink, tata, uh, drink tea and change your thinking. Okay, mm -hmm. chai pio soch badlo. Uh, that was their tagline. So we came up with an idea that we will profile uh, 25 ordinary Indians across the country who have seen a problem, uh, who have, whose community has been grappling with a problem, and they have done something extraordinary to find a solution. So ordinary people with extraordinary deeds. Uh, we will profile 25 people because they have thought differently. They have come up with some out of the box idea. And so Tata T came along because that was you know, fitting that tagline. It was a great editorial project because you were not compromising uh, any of your editorial sanctity. And for Tata T, it was a great opportunity. So we profiled these 25 uh, people and it was a, a uh, very, very uh, detailed, rigorous exercise, uh, you know, through 700 nominations across uh, 30 states. We went through every case and we said, okay, these are the stories which have not been told. Uh, and I'll tell you the story, The out of the 25 people, the hero of mine uh, was a guy called uh, 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 Banwasi Musahar. Uh, this is, uh, he belonged to the rat eating community which is the lowest of the, uh, you know, in the who live in the lowest rung of our past hierarchy. They eat rats, okay? Here is a seventh grade uh, guy who was a Brooklyn worker, uh, had studied up to class seven. He realized that the children from his community are not going very far because they don't get after school support. So he would constantly listen to the radio and read the newspaper, pick up things. And after the children come back from school, he would teach them. And that's how, with his sustained effort over a decade, the first two graduates from his community emerged. So we thought he was our hero, okay? Now we did this project, 25 part article, taking half page in all our three, uh, two newspapers, digital. We had a thing going on, on also on the radio. We finally brought up a profitable book and that profitable book was released, guess where? In Taz Mansingh, where we got all these 25 ordinary Indians who had never seen Delhi. We brought them here and we got the rural development minister. Uh, we had this 
present finance minister also was present there and it became a big show their stories got told to a much wider audience and i i mean i can go on what was the you know how things panned out after that lots of kind of you know people came in and said what can we do so this character who was my hero i thought amongst the 25 so we won a we won an award you know internal company award so there was about 1 and 1/2 lakh rupees so i went on to the stage and i said i am going to give this money to mr musahar okay and then the ceo said i will match it with 1 and 1/2 lakh with that 3 lakh when we went to that village to uh, felicitate him uh, you know let me tell you he didn't have clothes to wear and come to our function we had to buy him a pair of clothes he didn't have a bank account to encash our check we had to get a bank account opened in his name and the local mp there said he also got excited a big newspaper has given this honor to somebody in my village for the first time these mahadalit caste people actually sat on chair on chairs in a function and the local mp got very very overwhelmed by the whole thing he said i'm going to give 5 lakhs rupees from my mp lad fund so at the end of it we had 8 lakhs rupees we immediately at that night called a panchayat meeting there and we said build with this money a shed for after hours teaching to the the mahadal children now you see that it is not just that you can bring the stories of hope stories of achievement uh, you know to a wider audience but you can also media can also create a platform where these stories inspire others and replicate uh, that's that's a very positive and heartening intervention that media can make Absolutely, and hearing that story, you you know, the hairs rose on my arm. I mean, it's the kind of story that makes you, you know, that makes you stop and and think. But I, what year did you say that was that this event happened? That the story happened and the event happened? The the coffee table book. Yes. Yeah, we 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 compiled a coffee table book. What what year? Uh, this was 2012. The project was called India Awaken. Oh. Okay, so that was ten years ago. Have you done anything like that since? <laughs> uh, well, no. I mean, afterwards we tried to do a few other things, but well, you know, I've been out of full-time journalism. Okay. But uh, but I keep you know I I keep giving suggestions to various people, drawing from that experience, and I think you know many people are today doing many more interesting things, much more interesting than what we did probably ten years ago. Well, and then boom, like a shot over to you, Nilesh, because you are you are that person doing those interesting things. You're uh, I don't I don't know when the coffee table book is coming out, but you are you are constantly telling these stories. You're putting them out there. Your coverage is amazing. Your viewership, because one of the things that I'm wanting to know is we do these stories. We feel good about it. We get ripples. We win awards. But how many eyeballs do they really reach? How many people are really watching? So what do you what do you think Nilesh is it is it is it just is are, are do we have the capability to turn these stories into rich material do can NGOs approach you with these kind of stories and you you can you have the magic to turn them into something that's powerful and potent and that that makes the hair stand up on the the back of our arms Oh Mike uh unmute Thank you Uh, yeah, so a couple of thoughts. Uh, firstly, to what uh, Rajesh said, uh, there's something that's been uh, bothering me for uh, a few months now, and uh, um, I've discussed it internally with uh, Nidhi Jamwal, our deputy managing editor. Also, why are we doing this? Why are we doing what are we doing? What whatever we're doing, right? So. Uh, when we started out as journalists uh, the our target audience so to say our you know was the government we were we were reporting things we were reporting problems uh, some uh, mostly and um government officials or politicians would read them and um and fixed them uh, and that was our purpose we were postmen that's what we were um then at some point the humility went out of journalism uh tv news started photo bylines had to be started to catch up in newspapers and um 
journalists started to believe that they were not covering a story, they are the story. Um, that I'm here is the story. That I've reached here is the story. Corporate uh, interests uh, pushed hard and, and pushed deep and, and somehow uh, I think today that that target audience is not interested. A large part of the media, uh, um, you know, uh, has uh, uh, has decided that uh, it's it, that footwork is not its priority. Uh, that the footwork of journalism, which which died uh, a long time ago, is is not the priority. And especially when we arrived in the digital age, footwork died. So my question uh, to ourselves uh, at Gaon Connection and to my colleagues in general was like, why are we doing this? So we are doing this to bring some positive change. We are told often fashionably that journalism is speaking truth to power, but power doesn't care about journalism corporate power, political power, administrative power. For a long, long, long time, it doesn't care. Journalism has lost its teeth in India. So what do we do? We change the position of the camera. And our, our target group has to be the people. They were always, for me, they were always in India Yatra, there was no politician of any party whatsoever because my target group was different. But I'm saying, what if the only prism of our work is impact? And that's what we now as Gaon Connection want to do, uh, uh, to, to measure everything we do through some kind of impact. Now, to come to uh, the story that he just narrated, the fascinating story of those 25 people, that is what journalism should be about. I often talk about this story I did, uh, our uh, colleagues did in, in Gao Connection many, many years ago about a uh, school in Behraich uh, near the Nepal border uh, where the girls' toilet didn't have a door. I mean, out of the thousands of Gao Connection stories, this I, is one I often talk about. And um, our we we did a picture of that on the we used to have a newspaper then we, on the on the front page and and then the entire district got doors fixed in girls toilets and i always say this that this is why we came to this profession for to go get doors fixed on the uh, on on girls toilets that that's why we are here that's why we do journalism and i think it's it's for people like us we have to go back to the basics now we have to Reevaluate that the chest thumping, the, the 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 bravado, the ego of having you know maybe political parties or administrators notice our work, but not cause impact is not good enough. So let me come to the NGOs. The, the question you asked. The NGOs uh, are at the forefront of causing impact, of leading that impact. But like Rajesh also mentioned, of not of documenting that impact. Um, so uh, as as we speak, we are trying to put together a kind of a model where we can work with NGOs that we sort of curate, whose whose work we would like to document. But more than that, document the extraordinary. Uh, human narratives on the ground, which don't get documented. Look at Goonj. Goonj, uh, you know, Anshu and I keep talking about it. There, there, there are thousands of stories of people of villages building roads by themselves. Not that this is something to celebrate. You know, we, we all end up celebrating every time people get together and build roads and bridges. It's a abject governance failure, and that's why they did it. But I'm just saying the sheer human perseverance that comes across in these human narratives in, in everyday India that is witnessed by NGOs is not documented. We would love to document that. So we would love to partner with NGOs on, on that count. We would love to reevaluate completely about why we are doing what we are doing. 
we are not if we cannot cause impact then let us change our focus of where, where the camera is uh, is is looking at we are not interested this is not about uh, you know uh, just getting uh, likes from some government officials or uh, uh, you know some retweets or some replies if it's not causing positive change in any person's life on the ground it's meaningless right i think that I, I, i'm sorry maybe i'm i'm, I'm meandering a bit but i i find this important because we are in a, at a time when and when gaon connection started in 2012 there were multiple news digital news platforms right some survived some could not because all of them fight similar battles and all of them have to look back and say did we did we were we able to do even a small part of what we set out to do my answer is no my honest answer is no so i have to change gears i have to change tack because my only and only prism has to be impact and how can i fix those broken doors that is that is the only reason i came to journalism for i had the platform of hindustan times and ap at one point but i don't so what does a platform like us do or rather do should we remain happy in our cocoon that okay well 2 million people reach us every month read us and you know whatever that's meaningless you know so i think uh, that is really beginning to bother me and i'm I, it's it's a good kind of churning i would love to collaborate with people on the ground and uh, i think something great would come out of it. I, I love that this <clears throat> this far into um, your career, you're still having existential crisis. Um, that's great because so many of us are just like, yeah, all right, we we're here, we've done it. Now I've created this thing, it's got me prestige and awards, and now I can sit back a bit. But no, you're still struggling as if you're an 18 year old fresher on the beat for the first time. So I think that's awesome. Um, I will say that um, we we should we should probably talk after because one of the things that we're doing. At Village Square, which I think is 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 something cool that you know you guys can do with in your own special way too, is we team up with a lot of the the NGOs and civil society organizations, and we give them a space. We have a, a blog space, for lack of a better word, in our strand called um, Field Field Journal, and they they're there to just tell. And sometimes they um, wax lyrical about some program that they were part of, and that that numbers um, they saw numbers change. And other times, like recently earlier this week, we have people. Who are kind of actually using it as a space to get some stuff off their chest, which is look at the state of of this district and what the government workers in this district have to to put up with because their 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 surroundings are so poorly um, fitted out and how can they do their job well? So I think it's great to try and give a voice to the people that are actually at the sharp end doing the work. Um, I would like to know though if. Kind of going back to the point of um, whether it's 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 journalists who are passionate about getting these stories out, or campaigners and development workers who are passionate about telling their stories and experiences, could they go about it a different way? Are we seeing the story too much through the prism of urbanites, of aspirational Indians? In other words, we're looking at at, at everything through the prism of of them and them there are two different indias and never the twain shall meet and i wonder why we're not looking at rural india not just for the the stories of woe and the the stories of of of, of change that need to happen but through the same prism that we look at urban india with which is lifestyle culture food yes we cover festivals but why don't we cover what what the trends are for fashion why don't we cover what people's desire what what music they're listening to what food they're eating and because can you jump in on this and 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 give your thoughts on if you think that maybe we need to be looking at the stories that we're telling for rural india or those in the margins through a different prism you know i would um, thanks india i would like to actually first take two points which uh, initially what rajesh said about the hope stories of hope i think that is something which is very important because when we see stories of hope when we hear stories of hope that obviously motivates each one of us so you know whether i mean a lot of people don't know whether it's the forest man of india or whether it's an asha worker who's on the forbes list you know so those inspire us and even what uh, nilesh said you know i mean when we we i mean the impact like you said the toilet with the door i mean stories like that 
we need to do stories which actually bring about a change on the ground. Everybody knows the problem, right? I mean, uh, we know, okay, if we know that, okay, Melgaat is a region where children have been dying because of malnutrition for years, uh, it comes as a headline and then suddenly it just goes off. But what is the solution to it? So I also feel, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if I'm, you know, if I can put it across, but I also feel it's really important when we are putting out a story out there, of course, it's more digital now, but we really need to go on ground and see, give a solution for it rather than just saying, okay, this is the problem. So I mean, impact stories, stories of hope, uh, whether you're going you know, into the tribal communities, when we're talking about the marginalized, of course, the interiors, the remote areas. But if you imagine put out their stories, there, if it inspires each one of us, and even coming to the NGOs, like um, what we were talking about, you know, how important a role they play. Of course, how connected they are to the people out there, what work they are doing, and then we put out those stories out there with a the solution, it may be able to impact and reach more people. Lindy, can you okay. hear me? Yeah, you, you froze, so I wasn't sure if, if you had finished or not. Um, I think let's talk about impact. Let's talk about impact and let's talk about measuring impact because um, that's that's one of the, the, the things that's missing, right? Some of the stories can be great stories and touching stories, but as Rajesh said, you know, how, how, um, how honest are they? Um, we can pull out a story that's a, a good example of, 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 a, of somebody who's struggling or somebody who's succeeding um, after, after a challenge that they've gone through, but anecdotes are anecdotes, right? We want data. So Village Square has launched a, a, data, a development intelligence unit just recently, was just announced, where we're, we're, we're getting the number crunchers and the statisticians to to team up with all sorts of government organizations and, and civil society organizations and try and actually measure the impact of schemes and of data. But I wanna know how important do you think having data in stories would give them more weightage and more relevance and would be more of, of, of an appeal to readers? Do we think that measuring that impact, I know that you were talking about the impact of the stories we give, but what about the impact first of the, the programs and the schemes that are out there? How important is, is measuring that data and presenting it to the public? Um, how important is that as part of the storytelling? Who wants to take this first, Rajesh? Uh, yeah, I'm a number guy, so I can take it. Great. Um, I think very important. Uh, very important because uh, you know, you, you, you titled today's discussion, giving voice to issues on the margins and the marginalized. Why do you want to give voice? Obviously you want, there's a hope that giving them voice would help change things, okay? But let's bear in mind, policy doesn't get made on the basis of perception or assertions. Policy gets made on the basis of data and evidence. So I think data plays a very important role and should play a very important role. The difference that we see today and what was it a decade ago, you know, a journalist had to struggle to get a lot of data and evidence that would really make a story a lot more meaty and a lot more meaningful. Today, actually, and again, you know, this is the opportunity that has come with digital technology. And also in terms of very different kind of new research that has happened uh, over the past two decades uh, in terms of change in research focus. So today, for example, I have a place like uh, 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 JPAL, uh, Abdul Latif Jamal Poverty Action Lab, right? Uh, which is led by the Nobel Laureate of Jit Banerjee. Okay, now JPAL collects a lot of data. Uh, I can access them. You yourself said that you have, you are procuring data. I can partner with you as a journalist, right? I mean, there are so many sources. Nilesh, also in the process of down connection, he has also procured a lot of data. Uh, so, you know, it's, 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 it takes a little effort to figure out where to go to get them, but you can get them. So today you can actually combine data, voice and faces to create a lot more powerful storytelling and therefore not only draw the attention of audience, but also make those stories have 
a bearing on policy making having said that i want to now come to the most important and pertinent point which is what i think nilesh briefly mentioned at the end of the day we say journalism is about speaking truth to the power the question is can you really speak truth to the power and more so in today's context it is in this respect i i kind of stay very uh, uh, i mean i really don't have much hope or i don't i'm not very optimistic at this point in time uh, because in order to give voice to the issues on margin or the marginalized what does that mean it is about reckoning the truth and how do you reckon the truth if i don't have if i don't get safe water in my village how do i reckon with the truth i have to put that story in context why do i not have safe water you know then it kind of gets dragged into what is the policy what is the state of governance who is responsible for it who is accountable for it you know when you try to put the stories in context and perspective and if you really reckon the truth then you have to take it to the logical end and when you try to take the story to the logical end that's when you kind of create trouble <laughs> for others and for yourself so uh, the state of media that today uh, we see uh, you know it doesn't make me feel very optimistic about it doesn't make me feel very excited about the opportunities that other things are kind of presenting me be it digital technology be it the kind of networks that are coming together be it uh, the maturing or the great work that might be getting done by organizations i know i see all of these things i can do a great job but you know how far can i go with it now for a reporter today to start even at the grassroots level you raise the difficult question tomorrow you are targeted we see you know what happened to some journalists covering sand mafia we saw some journalists who were talking about some corruption in a, in, in the construction of uh, certain developmental projects in bihar we see uh, we hear about and a lot of it also doesn't get reported uh, but it's not that journalists are not risking their lives to honor the stories but it's just that you know you can't go very far with this and let's also remember one thing india you know one of the things where we have faltered big time despite being 75 years uh, uh, into independence uh, journalist protection there is there is nothing to protect journalists here it's it's an irony you know there was a time when indian journalists they all you know they all you know whether it is their proximity to power or whatever they never thought of institute building institutional protection for their profession compared to western democracies we have no nothing to protect us here we are the one of the most vulnerable professions uh, so it is it is in a way we are also people on the margins so uh, well uh, on the margins but able to speak quite freely <laughs> on web no 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 i i beg to differ with that it is no longer the scenario look at the kind of constraints now journalists have look at the kind of constraints uh, journalists have if i try to put out something on my social media i'm not very sure where i'm going to land tomorrow so i mean that's there so now let me come back so what is the solution and i completely agree with nilesh we have to turn the camera okay and we are reporting on people and people are our audience that and you know through this storytelling if we can contribute to political empowerment economic empowerment social empowerment of people then that can bring about change that happens with stories of despair it also happens with stories of hope i was talking to you about india our camp let me just uh, i will take one minute to also say how differently you can influence it is not that you know a story has to make impact only when somebody in power has to take note of it there are different ways stories can have impact so one of those 25 characters was a gentleman called um, mr arnu mugam if i am getting the name right 
he, he was our find based on whose story a movie was made called the padman the akshay kumar starer padman this man in coimbatore saw the problem of sanitary pads how unaffordable they are so he wanted to produce low cost sanitary pads and you know he went through hell to do that but he did come up with that he was our first find when we this india awaken series he was featured there first when his story appeared in hindustan times it got picked up by bbc a few months later got picked up by cnn and then you know everybody started reaching out to him then he became a ted speaker and then you know he became a celebrity and then you had the movie you know called padman which the government said it will be tax free and that story then spurred across india several organizations came up with initiatives to manufacture low cost sanitary pads so what an important contribution that story made uh, you know the long tail that it created so you don't necessarily have to put the camera on the people on power there are other ways to achieve things you just have to you just have to uh, figure out uh, how many ways a story can make impact and get the story done that way thank you Yeah, I think that's that's really interesting. It's like when you feel you're caught in one corner, you don't just sort of put your hands up and say, "Well, that's it. I I can't get out." But you find another way to sneak around and and to to get the story out or make impact. And because you've taken up a lot a lot of different interesting stories in the the last few years, have you found that they have had the impact? As one one question, and then the second question is turning it on its head. Would those stories have been more impactful? had you had data or more data or other stories that you've worked on how important was having data in those stories to try and get them out to a wider audience and and have and resonate more and as we just says you know um rattle the cages possibly of of the movers and shakers that that hold the real power um yeah i think when we talk about numbers and data i absolutely agree with what rajesh said numbers and data play a huge role when it comes to uh, you know any story whether it's a documentary which uh, the, the kind of stories we do at ndtv you know whether because you need to if it's an important important subject you do need time to say because with television you know the visuals of course but in a 2 minute story you can't do much so if it's a documentary like you're talking about menstruation if you have data say that okay these many women bleed you know for so many years in a month you know that it's more impactful because that actually the viewer connects or if you say these many kids or you know i mean just talking about when we really talk about okay 4000 weeks you know is what we have when we are alive so you know numbers like that make an impact or you know if you if it's talking about plastic waste or anything where you really want to leave an impact i think numbers make a huge role and yes there have been i mean like the first part of the question uh, which you asked was about you know the impact the kind of stories which we've made yes like we did a story on manual scavenging uh, of course we you know the kind of stuff i mean unfortunately even again when we talk about law and policies which uh, nilesh rajesh have been talking about it in the camera around but actually getting those people out there people making promises but nothing happening on ground but when we go to those people when they come on national television and talk about their challenges or whether you know when when those kind of stories you see uh, for that matter like mr bachan he when he was on board we we did see a huge impact on that but again it's important that we follow back and see where are those stories or what really is the impact i think going back time and again to that story to see okay that is that story really making an impact of course like the padman i mean that was amazing you know the guy what he went through but uh, like rajesh said most of the people only got to know through the story through the movie otherwise a lot of people know about it when we are researching like menstruation is something which i have been covering a lot even for me when you go into the interiors or remote areas of india and you know you still actually see that you know women still use um, leaves and sand so forget about having the basic right of air water what we talk about or even menstruation pads i mean they 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 are exposing themselves to so many diseases you know so just small things like that i think when you put out stories which has human connect i think that is the most important because in each one feels connected to it and you want to bring about that change and like i like i said earlier as well wherever we can of course a lot of uh, unfortunately in our country we don't have data on a lot of things we still wait for the government whether it's the nhfs report or uh, some reports you know which take years to come or whether it's you know the census i mean so many things we still don't have i mean when we because i cover health i see we don't have any health data i mean unfortunately like how other countries have 
we don't really have so much data. So you are dependent, but whatever you can put data on whichever stories, yes, it's definitely more impactful. That's that's so interesting, especially that you, that you mentioned the word um, documentary there. A few years ago, I was um, ra rather horrified as um, somebody who's, let's just say, somewhere over the age of 30, to find out that people under the age of 30 call two to three minute videos documentaries, if you please. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering about pivoting now a little away from, from data, although Nilesh, if you wanna pick that up too, you can, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested, you're the storyteller extraordinaire. How has social media and the, the Twitter sort of, you know, uh, everything in a small bite and Instagram, everything that has to look good and be, be on TikTok or Instagram style. How has that changed the way you as a storyteller have operated? And, and again, just coming back to this, trying to be useful to the, the people that want to get their stories out. Do you have any, any words of wisdom for people that are trying to get their stories out there in this new and changing world? And like I said, if you want to throw in, in data to that mix as well, please do. But I, I really want to hear what you think about this new way of, of storytelling and how that's changing what you're doing. I think there's a parallel here to what <clears throat> uh, my radio journey has been when I started um, uh, storytelling on radio unwittingly. I never wanted to, but I kind of stumbled onto it. Uh, I was told that nobody wants to hear stories in this day and age. Nobody wants, uh, 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 you know, uh, storytelling on radio for sure. And radio is about Bollywood, etc. There were rules that were handed down to me. And uh, uh, when we started uh, this show that I do called the Slow Interview. The conventional wisdom was we were already in the uh, Instagram era, we were already in the Reels era, and and yet the slow interviews are, uh, you know, one hour, two hours, three hours, sometimes four hours long, and people watch them and say, uh, they send it too soon, um, and we are privileged uh, about that. Now, I feel uh, one thing is that, and I or do this all the time, that I, you know, um, moping about the state of Indian television news or Indian, um, you know, the, uh, the text-based journalism or digital journalism and, or, or, or let's understand that uh, there are businesses and what if tomorrow stories of broken doors of girls' bathrooms to come back to that, um, were so well told that they got so many people watching them and reading them that suddenly ad revenues were coming to them or to these stories of human survival and, and everybody would be happy. Is it also about the fact that journalists are not doing their job well? We talk about data journalism, but data journalism always existed. The, Example, I told you about the my RTI, uh, you know, uh, on uh, the Naxal presence. That was in 2010, 11, I think. It was way back. It was, and those 252 pages, and I and me drew, culling out one, uh, you know, one one takeaway from that that 52 percent of budgets were not being used uh, back then was data journalism. It, we, we had not invented that phrase yet. And there were my peers who were doing this far, far, far better than me, you know? So, I mean, the question is that, is the fact that maybe two people or three people out of 100 are crunching numbers, which earlier 80 were doing or 70 were expected to do, and it's become this special you know, this guerrilla force of data journalism, well, why? I mean, data is integral to all kinds of journalism. It has to be done. It's not some fancy new, uh, uh, you know, superpower of journalism. Long form or rather telling your stories well. My crib in the newspaper era was that we should only judge our stories by, are they able to convey what they set out to convey and that too in an interesting manner. Or are we saying that, hey, 
a story that's written in a long form manner that is is belongs in only the features pages that that hellhole well where all all the serious uh, work is supposed to die that was the that was the demarcation that the that the front page is all about the prim and proper two died three died and you know a, a eight paragraph lead in the uh, seventh paragraph kind of story and and then the well etched um 25 word lead and the nut graph in the third paragraph and the beautiful lovely narrative belonged only on site but then that was also hard news journalism that we were doing it was just, and plus it was just better told so i think these the labels that we are now now only now coming up with what they doing what is non data journalism then what is journalism without data at gaon connection yeah so there's an era of there's a there's a generation of journalists who had who, you know they say in hindi oh, when they are cooking rice from one grain they can know if it's cooked or not the journalists of until a certain generation had that craft that if they talk to 10 people in a village they can catch that trend right and okay many times they got it wrong or whatever whatever especially political reporting which is that amazing superpower of journalism where you have you have you know power without any accountability you can predict anything you want and nobody will come back to it at any point and and, you know, and ask you hey you said this and what you know look at what happened but anyway but no that that power of assessing trends by catching that one grain of rice has has weakened has waned we had I'm, i'm proud to say that we had that power we had that patience we went out into the field we were able to catch the trends i not in politics i don't uh, claim to be a political reporter at all I'm, i'm but other trends but if that has waned then we need data now when we're talking about data we we should actually talk about two kinds of data one is available government data which is in public domain how are you using that because journalists sadly are not even able to use that my entire the the uh, the india bc series that we did was based on publicly available data that we got from uh, rti district by district we knew in which government scheme how much money was uh, allocated and how much was spent and how much was lapsed it was all public domain what we have done at gaon connection since 2020 the middle of 2020 is that we have set up a separate entity called gaon connection insights where can you lead the narrative by collecting primary data right most of our journalism right now even that not being done is can you can you use census figures better can you use the the crime uh, you know the annual report the health uh, report? can you, can you use them well can you i mean it's uh, one of my the, the beautiful moments of agency journalism as an ap reporter was to go through to these dense boring con- press conferences where people will be parroting off numbers and come up with some you know nice interesting story and nobody would really care except <laughs> except you and maybe your uh, news editor but 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 yeah so this what we have started doing is we release a, a, a survey from we have we have people in 480 districts of the country we are india's biggest rural insights platform and we don't have the funds to run it so what do we do so we are trying to somehow balance that and we came up in 2020 with a report called the impact of covid in rural india and we made it in public domain because we also wanted to show that uh, you know we want to subject ourselves to the highest degree of academic uh, scrutiny and this now suddenly un entities are our partners and governments and nabard and, and those people are working with us and we, we so now what we're doing is we are creating a new set of primary data and we would love to collaborate with ngos on that within you know with a tv channel on that on what that data is saying because until now we were dealing with the available primary data which is not made really for rural india you are interpreting it for rural india but here's i want to know 
how many how how much distance a woman in a village has to go to on an, an average to fetch water i know that right what do they feel about farm laws what do they feel about um uh, you know the vaccine would they pay for the vaccine if the we did the survey which had very telling replies if you were getting the vaccine uh, if you had to pay for the vaccine who would get it first and who would get it last the daughter in law was getting it last in family after family well no surprises there so i think so those are the two data monoliths that 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 we are kind of working and we hope uh, with some funds we are able to reinvent this narrative where we will be giving primary data that others can interpret uh, we will be you know making it open source and hopefully that will be leading a lot lot more conversations regarding rural india again looking at this through the the prism of trying to help uh organizations and activists and ngos get their story out there i i i feel i feel kind of warm and fuzzy feeling maybe it's the the pitter patter of rain maybe it's the 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 fading light but i i do feel that there's there's sort of hopeful um uh, uh, advice and and interest in these kind of stories from you guys some of the the leaders in your field and i really Thank you. I think that there's a question from the audience that we're going to get, but before I hand over to Vinay for that, I just want and and I and I'll give you like a flash when when your time is running out. I just want in 30 seconds or less if you can. And I'm I'm going to start with you first. What is the one or two bits of advice you would give to an NGO or an activist who is passionate about a cause or a person leading a cause or a story or a campaign? and they want to get that covered what advice would you give them 30 seconds so i think first of all the ngo needs to be credible itself it, secondly they need to go out there and i mean once we know they re- need to reach out to the right vertical i can say from the ndtv perspective again because of different verticals i think it's important to reach many times a story gets lost because you've not reached out to the right you know person after that and again one needs the ngo whatever story it is whatever thought they have whatever they're passionate about i i also feel that if somebody is passionate about something and it's put out there the right way it will get covered you know i think i mean a, a lot again i i because i do believe in that whole the connect the bond i think that's that's really really important and as for as for the nga ngos we are always even at ndtv i mean when we are doing these campaigns we are also looking out for ngos we are trying to look i mean like we were talking about stories it's not possible for us to go all across but when like if it is gao connection or any of you know organizations which are really really working in the interiors it's not possible for us to go so everybody is on the lookout to the, at the end of the day to put out the good stories there the real stories out there with solutions and an impact Excellent. Well, you can always come to us if you want a good NGO yes, for a story sure. you're working on. We'll point you in the right direction. Rajesh, over to you. Thirty seconds. Last bit of advice. The NGO must have clarity on whether it wants the issue to be covered or it wants itself to be covered. Uh-huh. Ooh, very good and very succinct. Right. You're giving you're giving the next twenty seconds to Nilesh. Nilesh, you have forty five seconds. Over to you. I'd say uh, uh, focus on the human narrative and don't um, don't have your agenda sit on that human narrative. I've had a, several examples, bad exa- uh, bad experiences, where I I went discovered a narrative and I found that it was not being uh, given to me in a correct and an honest manner. Uh, but the human stories work best with people on my side. We're also you know we are NGO at heart. Uh, we are a private limited company, but we are NGO at heart. We would we want the, to do the same things uh, and to point out and you know amplify the same issues and the same stories. But uh, I, I think uh, the objectivity, uh, if if that can stay in some uh, measure uh, alongside the passion, uh, is something to 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 care for. Excellent, interesting objectivity and passion. I think you've actually just summed up journalism right there. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to all of you. Let me hand over to Vinay because I think there's a question from the audience. Thank you, thank you, Lindy, for uh, moderating this. Uh, we have had some excellent discussion, and, uh, and you know, um, I think the more I was hearing a friend from journalism, I was reminded of my old days when I was a journalist. 
And there is always this dilemma that, you know, when you are a journalist, you are always looking for good stories. But when you are in the NGO world where you're working with all the people in the field, you have so many stories that you don't know how to go out and, and put them out there. So I think uh, all, all of you have really suggested some very good ways to move forward. We'll want to connect with you. But, uh, you know, uh, there are a couple of questions. I think the time is less, so I'll ask just uh, uh, maybe one or two questions. Mm. It's actually, uh, you know, mm, directed to Nilesh. Uh, and, and the question is that, you know, your experience of, I, I think partly you, you kind of answered this, uh, you have been experiencing a number of different kinds of media platforms and in different languages. So what has been your experience in terms of the impact, which, which platform and in which language uh, you think makes the most impact? Well, it uh, depends on what our target group is. If our target group is getting an IS officer to fix that broken door, it will have to be English, uh, unfortunately. Um, well, why should I say unfortunately? Uh, because there are a large number of officers in the country for whom English uh, or Hindi is not their first language. So, uh, but if the impact is, so I will take uh, 30 seconds to say what is impact for me? We did not uh, address that. Impact for me is very simple. It's a very common sense definition I've given to my team. Number one, we are we giving knowledge to our reader or viewer that helps him or her better their lives in a way. So will my farming income grow up? Will my expenses on health come down? Will I be able to pick up the phone and call the police if someone troubles my daughter because you told me of that number to call, right? So some information, that's number one impact. Number two, if I can solve problems. So can the superintendent of police of the district or the police department collaborate with me and say, okay, well, here are the problems. Oh, oh, well, we are here to address them and they get addressed. That is impact. That, that's part of my job. And the third, if they can get things, can they get sanitary pads in villages? Can they get, can kids get, you know, uh, pencils and notebooks? Can, uh, can, can, can agriculture equipment or seeds be provided? That also I consider as part of my job and impact. So my definition of impact is wider and probably not as a, uh, uh, you know, the recording has stopped. Probably not as pure uh, as 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 a lot of the uh, you know media traditional media um, approaches of speaking to power, etc. And right. if if that is so, then then uh, if the, if if knowledge has to be given, it's Hindi. If problems have to be addressed, well, it could be English. And sometimes Hindi, depending on the officers, politicians, what's their comfort. If things have to be given through corporates, it has to be English. So you have to, we have both. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, we'll probably wind up now. I'd like to thank all the. Vinay, there is, Vinay, Vinay, there is one question in the question answer box. I think it's an important question. I can take it if you, if you have time. Uh, yeah, sure. We can. We can yeah, the back. question I is the, the question is it was addressed to all panelists. Number yeah. of journalists who want to report from the villages is very limited. Journalists covering the most marginalized are not considered professionals, not considered so-called intellectuals. What can be the interventions on this part from news agencies and also the role of social media? Now, uh, if you permit me two minutes, I think this is a this actually directs us in a very important uh, direction. So I can take that question. So. I, I always believe uh, adversity uh, also comes with opportunity. Uh, today, what has happened, the scope of access journalism has significantly shrunk. Uh, people have very limited access now uh, to government departments. Uh, a large number of, overwhelmingly large number of journalists in mainstream media, you know, manage their career by just reporting on what the government is doing or is saying, now that is gone. A lot of them are desperate to look at other sources of stories. So there is an opportunity for all those people who have great stories and who can open their doors. So 
you know, this, you know, the fact that access journalism is no longer going to work for you can drive a large number of journalists to look for stories elsewhere. And there is an opportunity that needs to be cashed in on, number one. Number two, the way to cash in on this opportunity is to collaborate. Collaboration is the way to go. Structured collaboration, okay? Collaborations by many people is very ad hoc or informal. Uh, now you have to understand news organizations are also now low on resources. So that adversity also presents you with an opportunity where, uh, you know, let me take an example of an organization called National Foundation of India, which, you know, which kind of doles out 100 fellowships to short-term journalistic projects. And it ties up with various newspaper organizations to freely give those stories. Okay, they bear the cost, they make multimedia stories, and then they give it to various newspaper organizations. They tie up with different newspapers for different stories. So that's, you know, Village Square and several other organizations can look at those kind of collaborative models. So, uh, you know, the fact that news organizations are short on resources also presents an opportunity. Last, uh, mention of social media. Now, social media greatly enhances the scope of doing the kind of journalism that many of us would want to do because many a times we would not know actually what to, you know, uh, to, 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 you know, we get great leads through social media. Social media can offer you great leads to follow up and do great stories. The last but not the least is I think the solutions, be it solutions journalism or be it raising the, giving voice to the margins in our discussion, we are staying too focused on English language media. My sense is time has come for us to invest our effort in language media. You know, people in language media, we need to invest in their training. We need to invest in how to uh, help them come up, uh, embrace new storytelling techniques. And that's where I think the future of giving voice to the mar uh, marginalized lies is by investing in language media. That's all I wanted to say. Well, thank you very much, Rajesh. That was excellent. I think we, we really want to thank all of you and would love to be in touch and get back to you and take up your invite on collaboration. We would really love to take this forward. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry, I, I, I was saying something. I think I was on mute. mute. Yeah. Uh, I said, Lindy, Ambika, it was nice meeting you. Let's stay in touch. I would like to learn more from you. Um, yes, I think it's both. I think it's the other way around, but you're just being modest. Uh -huh. But yes, it's been lovely. I would love to, if, uh, Vinay, there's a way if I could get numbers, exchange numbers, because I think our goal is the same. So if you're on and, the same and, mission, uh, together we can achieve Yeah, and Lindy, okay. I'm new at PTI. I just joined them two months ago. But one of my key mandates